Good morning, dear Thai, dear Sangha, dear children. Are you with me? There's quite a few of you here. Yeah. The translation working? You get the translation. Samash? Pass. So, should we hear one more sound of the bell? Now, settle everybody down. Okay. Thank you, Bowtang. Everybody, and this part of the talk is for you children, okay, at the front. And I'm going to share to you this morning uh, on the subject of how you take care when you have a strong emotion. Do you know what I mean by that? What kind of emotions you get? Does anybody ever get um, angry? Just put your hand up if you ever got angry. Okay, oh, the adults as well. <laughs> this was just for the children. What about, did you ever get um, bored? Do you know, what? you never got bored. Oh, you did get bored one time. Huh? How about, is that a, what about getting sad? Anybody got sad one time? Oh, it happened, huh? The adults ever get sad? Oh, there's a few, yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's something when, um, when, I, went, when I was your age, and I think most of the adults here, your parents included, I don't know when they were your age that they ever were told what to do when you get sad, when you get angry, to take care of your emotion and be able to be okay. You have an emotion, but you're still okay. And so the chance to learn how to have an emotion but not be overwhelmed, it means like a wave comes and, you know, like if you're in the, the sea and a wave comes and crashes over you and you go completely underwater, you feel, oh, it's terrible. And you feel quite frightened because the emotion is so strong. It's like um, you're in a storm. wild storm. Imagine you're a tree in a, and that tree is in a storm and you're at the top of the branches. What happens to the top of the branches? You go whoosh, whoosh in the storm and you feel like that. You feel like you're at the top of the branches of the tree, yeah? So, I don't know, you've been here a whole week now, right? So does, has anybody taught you how to do breathing. Yeah? You taught her how to do breathing? Okay, so all the girls that are lying down, I want you to sit up. <laughs> yes, because we're going to practice being like the trunk of a tree. So I want you to close your eyes, sit up straight, see if, you're, if you can have your spine, the, your back like a tree, okay? You imagine yourself a tree. You can even put your arms up and imagine, okay? Put your arms up and imagine you're a tree. So you can, if, it, if you close your eyes, 
just feel being a tree like that. And where is the, where is the trunk of your tree? Where is the trunk? The base of the tree, right? Close to the ground. It's your tummy, right? So you're moving, but your tummy stays still. You're just moving at the top. And the storm is coming. The storm is coming. Oh, somebody's fallen over. <laughs> Must have been a very strong storm. See if you can stay, stay stable. You're rooted in the ground like a tree, but the top is going, okay? I don't want to see anybody falling over, but I want to see you moving this way and that way with the storm, okay? And you stay stable here. Now what I want you to do, come put your hands on your tummy and feel your in-breath and your out-breath. You feel it? Breathing in, breathing out, okay? Maybe Dukian come and share with the French children if they don't get the translation. So you are in touch with your tummy and you breathe in and you breathe out and it's like being in the trunk of the tree. So when the storm is coming like that, and then you go back to the trunk of the tree and you're breathing, you feel stable. So that is what you do when you have a strong emotion. Okay? Next time, because right now you're very happy. No strong emotion. Anybody angry at the moment? Nope. Anybody? S are you a little bit angry? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just go back to the trunk of your tree. Okay. Just here. <laughs> And anybody sad? Anybody sad? You're all happy? Or you're a bit sad? Okay, so go back to the trunk of your tree, okay? <laughs> so you breathe from here. Okay. So if there's a problem with the translation, Brother Dukian will share with you. Okay. Now, That is what you do when you have a strong emotion. That is what you can do. You can sit very still. You know, did you hear about the pebble meditation? Mountain solid. You can be like a mountain solid. If you like that one, you can do that one. Or you can be like the tree in the storm. But the main thing is that you really concentrate on your breathing and be solid, go where it's stable, okay? So to your tummy, you breathe in and out. So next time you have a strong emotion, you promise me you'll do that? Try that, huh? And just, if you can do that for one or two minutes, even the storm, it doesn't last forever. It feels like, oh my gosh, this emotion's so strong. Oh, it's terrible. My life is terrible because of this emotion, right? But like a storm, it comes, it stays a while, and then guess what? Guess what? Anybody paying attention? It goes. Yeah. It comes like a storm, it stays a while, and then finally it passes. And that's even if you don't practice. Eventually the storm goes, but if you practice, it goes much quicker and you don't feel so bad. And in fact, you know, our teacher, Tai, was once asked a question. You see that raccoon? He's very sad, okay? And he was asked the question, what should, by a child, what should I do when I feel sad? And the answer is to practice the breathing. 
And the image you can have is like when you're feeling sad, it feels like it's all raining, right? It's like sad like the rain coming down. And if you breathe mindfully, you just come back to your breathing, and guess what? You also... Anybody? Smile. If you smile, how can you smile when you're sad? Is it possible? You can smile when you're sad? You can smile. Thank you. It's wonderful. You can smile when you're sad. You can smile to your sadness. You're sad and you want to keep your sadness company and you say, hello dear sadness, and you smile with love, with compassion to your sadness. And how can you do that? How can you smile to your sadness? The way to do it is to breathe. If you're breathing, you're stable, solid like a mountain, and you can offer a smile to your sadness. And guess what happens? Guess what happens when you smile to your sadness? It's like you've seen, have you read the text? <laughs> you get, it's like the, the smile is like the sunshine going through the rain. And what happens when sunshine goes through rain? Yay! Now somebody told me that they... <laughs> Happy! <laughs> Very cute. I didn't choose that picture, but it's great, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Sister Hua Hop. <laughs> Okay, now do we have time for a story? Or are you bored already? Shall we finish now? There's, I have a story, but... Are you sure? I, I don't know, maybe it's not enough time. Huh? Shall I? I, try to be very, I have to be very quick, huh? but it's about... Read it, read it, okay. This is a story about taking care of another emotion. We just talked about sadness, but what about anger? Does that, when you get angry, do you, do you sort of, does that sort of look a bit like... Because this little boy here, he's called Anne. This little boy on the cover, he's called Anne, and that is his anger. Right. Now let me look inside this book. Mm, Anne's anger. Right. So, maybe... You see the little boy, Anne? Can you see him? There he is. Right? What's he doing? Do you ever do that? Yeah, building castle, building a block, blocks, right. And then that's his grandfather here, very lovely grandfather. Anybody still have a grandfather? Yeah? Oh, it's so lovely, isn't it? The grandfathers are so nice to us. Yeah. Maybe it could be your mother, maybe it could be your father. But in this story, it's his grandfather, okay? And the grandfather's making a lovely vegetarian meal for getting the plug in, for, for Anne, right? But Anne is building blocks, and he's very concentrated, putting every block on. Look, he's, he's just getting to a very high point. You know that feeling when you could just put one more block on? And then guess what? Grandfather says, time for dinner. <laughs> and he's, I mean, of course he wants to have dinner, but right now he's doing the blocks. And he's just about to put on this green block. And the grandfather says, put everything down. 
Put your blocks down. It's time for dinner. Well, guess what? Do you think he might just say, okay, grandfather, I'll stop doing the blocks and I'll just come for dinner? Is that what happens in the story? Is that what happens? What do you think? No. No? Uh-oh. That doesn't look... That doesn't look so clever, does it? That looks... He looks like he's crying. Why would he cry? Because he was so enjoying doing the blocks and he doesn't want to stop. And then the blocks completely fall over. And he's very, very upset because he put so much concentration into those blocks. And he tells his grandfather to go away. And he tells his grandfather, I hate you. <gasps> Would you ever say that to your grandfather? No. It's very, very bad. You never say that to your grandfather. But he was angry. So was it him? Was it Anne that said, I hate you? Or was it his anger? We're going to find out. But guess what? His grandfather told him to go to bed, to go to his bedroom. Now I want to just say something about this, because do you know something about his grandfather? He wasn't angry with Anne for being angry. He wasn't angry with Anne. He wasn't angry with his grandson. He recognized what had happened. But he knew that Anne, his grandson, needed to calm down. So he didn't take it personally when Anne said, I hate you. He said, you're angry. You need to go into your room and breathe. That's what he told him to do. And take care of your anger. But Anne didn't really know how to do that. So when he went to bed, he just dived onto the bed. And he felt terrible. And he said, you know, my, my, um, my grandfather has told me I have to sit with my anger. And he said, I don't know how to do that. How do I sit with my anger? And he just said, but I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry. And then guess what? Anger appears. That's Anne's anger. Does he look scary? Yeah. Pretty, it's pretty good. Could you do a better one? Okay. I think we should all have a go at drawing our anger. See if you can do a better version of anger than that. Okay. You're not scary enough, huh? You want him more scary. Okay. And then anger says, Hi, I'm here. Nice to meet you. And he's like saying, I'd hope you would, no I'd hope you would notice me. This is a big hairy creature with a red face and a green tongue. Oh. And then anger doesn't know, Who are you? And how did you get into my room? <laughs> well, I'm your anger. You brought me here. <coughs> and then Anne had a conversation with anger. And anger explained that I am what comes up. I'm this creature that comes up, this angry monster, when you don't get your own way. You wanted to do your blocks, but you had to go to dinner. And you got very angry. That's one thing that can make us angry, huh? When we don't get to do what we want to do. And it's very important, like doing the blocks. And anger suggested to Anne that why don't we go out of the room and go and shout at our grandfather again. <laughs> and Anne said, Ooh, I don't think that's a good idea. 
I've already said I hate him. So he kind of, even he's still angry, and he's got this anger, but he knows it's not a good idea to, to go out of the room. So he says, why don't we just have a dance in the room? So Anne and anger have a dance in the room. So he runs around the room, feeling his angry energy. Okay? And eventually, when he's danced around with the anger, he decides to do what his grandfather told him, and he sits still. And he does, what's he doing? What's he doing now? He's doing sitting meditation. He's sitting with his anger. So his anger's behind there, looking a bit disgruntled. The anger says, what are we doing? Look, he doesn't seem to be so happy anymore, the anger. But he's breathing with his anger. And it looks like his anger is also settling down with Anne. So he's doing what I said at the beginning, huh? Breathing from the belly. Breathing. And you can, you know, like I said, you can smile to your anger. Smile to your sadness. And you get a rainbow. You can also smile to your anger. Okay? So you smile. You see he's kind of smiling. And he's sitting very still. His eyes are closed. He's breathing. He's taking care of his anger. He's saying, hello, anger. They've had a nice dance, and now they're breathing. So this is something you can actually do. This is not just a story, right? And guess what happens? The more he breathes, look, his smile has become a bit more. He's got, whoops. Oops, I done something wrong. He's smiling, and anger is getting smaller, would you say? Is he getting smaller? Just checking you're still here. Yeah. You notice that, huh? Anger getting smaller. Why? Why is he getting smaller? One answer. But why is he going away? Huh? Go on. Well, you put your hand up. Because he's getting calmer, and so his anger also gets kind of smaller, right? So that's well done. You got the right answer. And then look, he's really small now. He looks like a cuddly toy. <laughs> he's even smiling. And then anger has a conversation with him and says, You know, you make me say really bad things. You made me, you made me say that I hate my grandfather, that's not nice. He says, well, that's true, says Anger. That's true, but also, I can be your friend. How can you be my friend? How can you help me when you're the one that causes me to do bad things, when you're the one that makes me angry? How can you help me? He says, well, all you have to do is recognize that actually, I can be your friend, and all you have to do when you notice me, is you sit with me, and you breathe with me. You spend time with me, and then you'll feel so much better. And then you know what? It was kind of fun, wasn't it? Hanging out in the room together, and we had a dance. So Anne persuade, Anne's anger persuades Anne that he doesn't have to be frightened of him. He doesn't have to think of his anger as an enemy. He can be his friend as long as he knows how to recognize, oh, my anger's come up. And then what does he do? He spends some time with the anger, breathing. So, then the grandfather comes back, and guess what? Anne is a bit tired now. Oh, look, grandfather and Anne together. And is that anger in the little flower there? So he's just gone into a little fight. He's still there, but he's no longer, you know, he's waiting for the next time. <laughs> and we know there will be a next time, right? But for now, anger is like a little flower, and the grandfather 
and Anne are having hugging meditation. Okay? So it's a nice end to the story. Right. We'll end it there. Thank you. Have a sound of the bell. Go back to our breathing. And uh, just practice to be like Anne, breathing. You don't have to wait until you have a strong emotion to enjoy your breathing, okay? So let's just have one sound where we practice really feeling in touch with our tummy, our breathing. And then we know where to go when we have a strong emotion. If you wait for a strong emotion before you practice, you might not know where to go. So this is for us to enjoy our breathing. Just three breaths, okay? Okay, the sound of the small bell. We can stand up and we can go and have a dance outside. Okay. You stand up and you bow to the Sangha. Dear Sangha, um, this is the 12th of July, Thursday, and tomorrow uh, is the end of the first week of our summer retreat 2018. We know that we are lucky to be here. There's many people um, wanted to come. I believe it booked a little bit quickly. and. Yeah, so we have to practice for many people. And I, I hope you've had a wonderful week full of uh, rich Dharma gifts for you to take home. And the talks uh, in the morning are just a small part of the experience of being in Plum Village, right? Just uh, some encouragement, some... some uh, sharing about the teachings, the Plum Village tradition, Thai's teachings, to remind us and maybe give us some inspiration. You may have noticed that this week the teachings had a, a theme uh, based on a certain very old, ancient Buddhist text. It was called the Anapanasati Sutra. It's the sutra on the full awareness of breathing. So it was a gui- it's basically a guided meditation which matches over with the Satipatthana Sutra, which is all about mindfulness in all the realms of life, applying mindfulness. And then this is a guided meditation of 16 exercises that we've been covering this week, but not um, religiously, 
not kind of dogmatically. We just it's just a, a framework for us to to have a look. But this guided meditation is very um, wonderful, and it really gives us uh, a whole journey to go on from becoming aware of the breath. Sister Chanduk on the first talk shared about awareness of the breath, awareness of the body, coming in touch with the body, calming the body, and experiencing this thing. Hmm, this, I've got a body. Maybe we've been out of touch with it for a while. Yeah. We get, I think she used the example of the, being at the computer and we lose touch with our body. And there's an, I, I always like to quote this Irish novel, The Dubliners, uh, James Joyce, and there's this character, Mr. Duffy, lived a short distance from his body. And sometimes we, we know that experience, we say, oh, that, that's, yeah, I'm not really in, I'm not really in, I'm not really present inside my body. And maybe we have the expression being comfortable in your own skin. Do you feel comfortable here? Is this a home for you? Can we make uh, coming back to the body a place of um, refuge, a place we can come back to. We know the body and mind are very connected, so when we bring attention to our body, we're also bringing our mind into the present moment. We're coming into the life, living experience of being in this body, in the present moment. And when we do like that, we feel, oh, life is possible. And we, as we were teaching the children, we very much need that kind of ability to come back and find our solidity, find ourselves being able to be present with what is because we also, as adults, as we found out, have strong emotions. We also go through difficult times. And we need to train ourselves to be able to be there for uh, our feelings, our emotions. We need to recognize our anger. The nature of anger is often that we immediately are blaming and we want to punish, and we have a very good reason why that person needs, we need to do, and it may feel like justice. We want justice, maybe social justice. We want to punish the other person, but then we have this feeling, oh, this isn't going to go well, I know what happens, and he's bigger than me, he may punch me, I don't know, but we suppress our anger. That's another way. So we can do two things. We can express or we can suppress. And that's often uh, the strategy that we have. And we didn't know, we were not taught as children, that there is this other way, which is neither to express nor to suppress, but to take care, to smile to what is happening from a place of stability, from a place of being with the breath, being, being in our body, being present, and not, uh, yeah, not being swished around like those branches, but coming back to the island of mindfulness. So this is the practice uh, we can do. And when we do that, we make an experience that
takes away something called the second arrow in Buddhism, which is the story we build around things. Uh, for instance, with an emotion like anger or fear, we become very frightened of our emotions if we don't know how to handle them. And when we make this experience of being able to be with the emotion, being able to smile to sadness, and we, make, we discover a beautiful rainbow is possible. It, it takes away this um, fear of the emotion. So the emotion is one thing. It happens. We can't avoid emotions because they're part of life, they're part of the human experience. But if we learn how to be with, and take care, then the emotions can come and go, and we didn't do more damage in the middle, but in fact, we learned how to, we discovered that we are capable of staying, staying with and being okay. Going through the storm, and we learn a lot. We maybe get an insight about what is going on. We maybe get to a place where we see differently, we have a different perception. And we realize maybe if we were angry at someone, we realize our part more. We take more responsibility. That can happen. Or we recognize, oh, there's something important I need to communicate to this person because I'm sure they don't mean to cause me to be angry, but they're doing something, they did something, and I need to let them know. Otherwise, uh, they may just do it again, unknowingly, hurting us again. So we let them know, oh, that's difficult for me when that happened. Uh, we're not blaming them, we're giving them information so that they can So dis discovering the, the impermanence of feelings is a wonderful thing. You know, when I shared with the children to say, what happens? And they knew, they said, yeah, the storm comes, it stays for a while, it goes away. And to have that recognition right in the middle of the situation, this too will pass can be very helpful. Impermanence um, can be a positive thing, right? So, the 16 exercises, they start with learning how to concentrate the mind on the breath, come into the body, be aware of the body, experiencing. They, help, they invite us to touch joy, touch the good conditions in life. All this is to build our stability and get uh, into a stable place. They help the, the guided meditation, the 16 exercises also invite us to take care of painful feelings, as just described. And Brother Fabke is sharing on the four right efforts, the four dil the dil right diligence, the seeds, taking care of the seeds as they come up. We discover that we can um, become aware of our mind, and just by smiling, we can change uh, the peg. Our mind is maybe a bit depressed, and we sit up straight, and we smile, and we breathe. Our mind can become happy again. And sometimes we recognize our state of mind being narrow,
And just by recognizing I've got a narrow state of mind, I've got a, we're already giving conditions for us to free our mind a bit. Recognizing what is going on is, is the key. Because just in that place of mere recognition, the rest is a kind of process which happens somewhat by itself. We don't need to do too much. Just stay present with what is. Keep smiling, keep breathing, staying present. The last four of the 16 exercises uh, begin with contemplating impermanence. So, there's also contemplating non-craving, contemplating uh, nirvana, and contemplating letting go. So, at this point, I have to let go of knowing how far we'll get down that list. <laughs> but I'll have something to share on them. Let's see where we go. Impermanence, I already, we've already touched in terms of impermanence of feelings. That's a real experience that we make. That's not just uh, something you read in a book. You make that experience. And it changes your life. It enriches you. And it gives you some, yeah, a lot of benefit. So the reason that these uh, contemplations are put in the context of a, a meditation on breathing is because we're not, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not to intellectually understand what is impermanence, what is nirvana. It's to actually practice. It's a practice. It's a training. And part of it is with impermanence, for instance, can be a training in the way in which we view things, you know, having right view about something. Why uh, is contemplating impermanence important? Why should it matter? It's, it's kind of obvious that things are impermanent. We, but we do have a tendency, because of a kind of fear, to want to grasp, on thing, grasp to things being permanent. We want to hold, have some sense of security. It may be based in something material, but it can also be just, you know, we all don't, we don't want to die. And we want to stay, we want to know that we will, yeah, continue. So sometimes we, we're grasping on to, this is me, and this is my body. And we discover, when we look deeply, that the nature of impermanence is everything is in, in a state of flux, a state of flow. Everything is in a process of becoming. There is no fixed uh, existence. Everything is in process. It's like a river. It's flowing. And you've maybe heard the saying that when you look at a river, you stand in that river, and then you stand in the river another time, it's a totally different river. It looks the same, but it's another river, a totally different flow of water. But sometimes things have the illusion of, you know, it's going to be like this for a long time. And we don't... Uh, and it can be useful to contemplate impermanence. Partly to shake us out of complacency, you know? For instance, if we're angry with somebody we love, could be our mother, could be our father, or our partner, Thai offered a very special meditation. It's very quick, 
It's just three breaths. But I've tried it, and it works. You, you, if you can hug the person, if they'll let you hug them, and you contemplate that person in your arms, and you imagine them 300 years from now, It's not uh, such a long time geologically, but it's, it's a long time for our life uh, span, right? We know that the lifespan will be over by then, and the body will be dust and have gone in the ten directions somehow. We're not sure exactly how things continue, but when we contemplate that person in our arms, we know we cannot, we, they're, they're somehow not graspable. And we have this feeling when we're with them, oh, how precious that you're actually here with me in this present moment. And an immediate feeling of cherishing that we actually have that person in our life, even there is a difficulty in the present moment that comes to us, and we feel grateful for that person. So it's something to try. Yeah. Maybe if you are angry with yourself, you could practice 300 year hugging meditation to yourself. <laughs> I know, how, who, where am I in 300 years? And come to cherish, okay, I've, I'm here now, that's what I... So sometimes contemplating impermanence can give us... Um, put us back in touch with reverence for life, cherishing what we have. Also, when we look at our life span, and we see we were born, and then we come up to the present moment, we went through so many stages, right? We were, before we were born, we were still that we were there as a fetus. Even before that, we can see conditions were around for us to come into being, what we call being. Maybe look at that concept. But as we uh, go through the stages, the babyhood, maybe we don't have any memories of being a baby, but we know we were. There's maybe pictures of us. And four years old, the little toddler, the little boy, the little girl, eight-year-old, and then you come to the big school, bit frightening, you're a teen, you become, uh, you get worried about exams, going to college, and you go through the young adult, you know, it's all here in Plum Village, have the children, we have babies, <laughs> children, the teens, the young adult, and the adults. 
We're all adults. And yet we know that there is a teen inside of us. If we're, even we're 50 years old, there is a 15-year-old in there. Sometimes he comes out. And there is also the child in us, still present. And sometimes the child shows himself when we don't get what we want. And somehow we have to also learn to accept that, yeah, we have to take care of the child in us also, yeah. not just the child outside. And it's wonderful in the sense that nothing is lost. So although impermanence, impermanence, yes, things are always changing, things are always flowing, and yet there is this sort of paradox that nothing is lost. All our actions of body, speech, and mind, they continue. And all of our experience is somehow held in our present, in the present right now we can access. And even going back further, we see that every cell of our body contains the information, the genetics of our parents, mother and father, grandparents, and going back, back, back. Right? And you can imagine, visualize generations you know, whizzing through 100 years, all of that history. There was a flow of life that brought us to this point. And even in evolutionary terms, we can even go back and see our animal ancestors. And we see how we, even this present moment, we have connection to our animal friends. They're actually our relatives. They're not just uh, another species separate from us. But we're, all, we're connected to all of life. So, what are we in all of that? If impermanence is the, part of the nature of life, impermanence is how things are, and nothing ever stays the same, then what is it that we fix on that says, this is us, this is me, this is the essence of the meanness of me, yeah. Whatever you, you, you give yourself a name and you will say, okay, this is, this is me, yeah. Anamaka, you have, uh, your name means uh, no name. <laughs> so, having uh, a name like that is an invitation to say, I I have no sign, I have no, nothing that pins me down to just being one thing. I'm constantly changing and I contain so many uh, realities, so many beings, so many conditions make up who I am. <coughs> so, contemplating impermanence like that, we discover we go on a journey and we f discover we are much, much more than we thought. We are our ancestors and we are our descendants. It's a slightly wobbly vertical line, but that's good because it's like a river of life. You could imagine starting from the mountain down to the valley, down to the ocean. This could be your life. 
But this can also be a line representing all your ancestors and your descendants. So maybe you are somewhere like in the center of that. So we see all our ancestors behind, our parents, our grandparents going back way, way, way. And we look into the future, we see our continuation. Not just in terms of children. Some of us don't have uh, physical children born. But in terms of how our actions continue as well. But this is like a stream of life and it rep represents impermanence, a, f a flow um, from the past, through the present, through the future. So impermanence seen from the aspect of time. You see that things are always changing in time. right? Then there can be a horizontal line So this is uh, the present moment. Oops. <laughs> we see um, that right now, in this present moment, across space, we are also, just as we are connected in time to our ancestors, to our descendants, right now, in this present moment, we are connected to all that is including, you know, our friends, our loved ones. And we feel a connection which is very profound. We feel that we, we really um, have some of our friends' qualities and our friend, we've influenced each other. As I was saying, genetically we see that we're also connected to other species. And so this is uh, from the point of view of um, space. We see that we uh, are much more than this little dot in the center, which could be us. But we're connected to all. If there is suffering going on in the world, we also are in touch with that suffering and we can identify and we can empathize and we know that that suffering is not just another person's suffering or another species' suffering. If Mother Earth suffers, we have to suffer because we're connected to everything, to life. And there are also, um, we could be encouraged to think of all of the people, both present today and in our ancestors, that we can be connected to that give us strength, give us um, wisdom. And in that way, we can draw uh, a sense of strength and wisdom to meet our situation. In the girls' team group, I was told there was a special uh, meditation that was done where the, the girls sat in a, in a circle and they called it Metta Meditation. And they were invited to close their eyes and imagine somebody, uh, imagine, um, first of all, imagine a difficult situation that they were facing. They imagined a difficult situation. And then they imagined somebody that they thought was very wise and very compassionate and very friendly and that they knew or they could, they were very connected to and bring them to their mind and bring them into that situation. And they could even imagine that person becoming them and how would they meet that situation? So we can tap into the wisdom of our ancestors or you know, very beautiful people in the present moment that we know 
and invite them to support us in a difficult situation. So that it's kind of making use of interbeing. This circle is to represent that we are much more than this dot here in space-time. We're connected with our ancestors, our descendants, and all species. We inter are. I'd like to read um, the third touching of the earth in this book. I see this body made up of the four elements is not really me, and I am not limited by this body. I am part of a stream of life of spiritual and blood ancestors that for thousands of years has been flowing into the present and flows on for thousands of years into the future. I am one with my ancestors. I am one with all people and all species, whether they are peaceful and fearless or suffering and afraid. At this very moment, I am present everywhere on this planet. I am also present in the past and in the future. The disintegration of this body does not touch me, just as when the plum blossom falls, it does not mean the end of the plum tree. I see myself as a wave on the surface of the ocean. My nature is the ocean water. I see myself in all other waves and see all other waves in me. The appearance and disappearance of the form of the wave does not affect the ocean. My Dharma body and wisdom life are not subject to birth and death. I see the presence of myself before my body manifested and after my body has disintegrated. Even in this moment, I see how I exist elsewhere than in this body. Seventy or eighty years is not my lifespan. My lifespan, like the lifespan of a leaf or of a Buddha, is limitless. I have gone beyond the idea that I am a body that is separated in space and time from all other forms of life. So that reading is from the third of the three touchings of the earth, uh, which is a, a basic practice from this tradition that Thai has offered us. We contemplate the words, we let the words come in and speak to us in our depths. It's not an intellectual discourse. We let it water the seeds of understanding in us and insight. And when we touch the earth, we're letting go of our notions that are kind of keeping, keeping us from experiencing reality as it is, There's the notions that keep us small, and we're allowing ourselves to get in touch with a greater context, a greater wholeness to our being, and in this way we, we touch um, connection which really allows us to, to let go of some of the fear about being a separate self with just this little life and this little body and recognize that we're part of something much bigger. And this practice of touching the earth is a concrete way to contemplate impermanence and non-self. 
So as well as just sitting meditation and breathing, contemplating it, we can hear these words and we can actually practice them and we're also in touch with our breathing. So we're taking it away from an intellectual, uh, discursive, analytical thing and turning it into a practice. And if we do this on a regular basis, we gradually uh, are able to yeah, let go, as I say, of some of these notions that, that cause us suffering. If we believe uh, that we were nothing before we were born, and then when we're born we're something, and then when we die we're nothing again, that is a concept, that is a notion, which causes us to suffer. We will fear, fear death will fear kind of an, an, um, a nothingness and therefore a kind of meaningless what's the point kind of feeling when we see that we're connected to, to life we suffer less from that thought we don't have that thought it's just a concept but we need to train ourselves to see like that So, this is um, one way in which we can, we can practice the contemplation on in, impermanence. We can, just as we're sitting here breathing, we can also recognize simple things, of just the impermanence of the breath. Breathing in, breathing out, we see the birth and the death of the breath but we're not caught by the notion of birth and death. We see that each breath follows another. There is a cycle. There's many ways to, to um, contemplate impermanence. Last of the four exercises is I mentioned is letting go, and I'm just going to mention that now because, in fact, in sharing about impermanence, uh, we've we've kind of covered it because the letting go in the in this guided meditation is letting go of the idea of uh, this is my body, the idea that this is my lifespan. So you can see that if you can massage that idea of that notion in you and gradually see in a different way, you can let go of that notion and you can touch uh, a much greater, greater reality. Nirvana is where is it what we experience when we're free from these kinds of notions and also when we're free from the afflictions of anger and hatred, craving, grasping, when we're free from fear and we're just embracing life with the you know uh, Jesus said to enter the kingdom of God 
You have to be a child. That kind of childlike wonder of coming, stepping into without preconceived ideas, with letting go of your notions and just being there and letting, letting reality reveal itself to you. There is a, an experience, we can, we can make the experience of nirvana as a practice. It doesn't have to be this final destination very far. Even in the, uh, some people would say nirvana is something you only can go to after you die. It becomes like heaven, you know. When you die, you go there. But in fact, uh, it, nirvana is a practice. Nirvana is more like a direction. And we have to be very alive to touch the experience of nirvana. So don't wait until you're dead. It might be a little late to, yeah. You can touch it in this, through this body, through the senses. You can be in touch with nirvana because nirvana is nothing more than the reality of what is actually going on. It's available to us all the time, the nirvana experience, because it is reality in a sense. So we have the opportunity to, to touch it any time. The question is, uh, yeah, do we take that opportunity? If, are we, can we make ourselves available for it. And as I've just said, the conditions for being available, available are to drop our notions, to drop our analytical thinking, and to be free, even if it's temporarily. Just drop your anger, drop your fear, drop your craving, and just be open to something bigger. And it's possible, even with the afflictions uh, will come and go, but we can make that experience. And then we have a reference that tells us, puts things in perspective. And the next time we have, uh, we get caught in a situation, get caught in an emo emotion and resentment, a bit like the 300 year hug, we have another way to distance and say, hang on a sec, I remember there's, there's a bigger picture. In walking meditation, uh, our teacher would always say that he never missed an opportunity to walk in the kingdom of God. And so another way of saying he became available for touching reality in the present moment. I remember um, practicing walking meditation with Thai in Deer Park, and we were with the big, the big Sangha, and we all went up a hill, and we all came down. And for the most part, my experience was one of monkey mind, just going this way and that way, and judging myself for not being a very good practitioner, not being able to concentrate on my steps, not being able to walk in the kingdom of God, <laughs> even I was with Thai, you know, and you feel like, oh. But, you know, at the same time, thinking, well, I'm not doing too bad either, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying my best. Yeah. And I remember we got, there's this beautiful little oasis of a garden, because it's mostly in Deer Park, it's sort of semi arid sort of chaparral country. And then there's this oasis garden in the center of the uh, um, Solidity Hamlet, the brother's place. And uh, so they, they, they water the grass there, so it's sort of very green, and there's these beautiful trees. And there's this big oak tree in the center. And hanging on the oak tree 
in a frame was this calligraphy of Thais saying, the kingdom is now or never. <laughs> so it's quite an imperative, you know. It's now or never. And I, I just loved to see that calligraphy. And then as I was about to walk into the garden, I was with my uh, brother. Uh, and I said, let's, when we step into this garden, let's actually step into the kingdom. Like, let's make it true that we step into the kingdom as we walk into this garden. And in that moment, uh, as we stepped in, it's a bit like those films, you know, you, <laughs> you go through this kind of imaginary force field. Step in, and suddenly there we were, in the kingdom of God. Should I say that word? Um, the kind of nirvana feeling. It was, it was as if, it was immediate. It was just from one and it came through this incredible intention. I'm going to do this. It's now or never. It's not about me. It's not even about my practice. It's about just dropping my thoughts about my practice, my who I am, and just becoming available to the experience. And with 100% really wanting it, but letting go, letting go of grasping for it, but just becoming available. And as I stepped in there, suddenly every step became magical. And immediately I had the thought, I don't want this to end. <laughs> and, I knew, and I'd only taken a few steps. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily that thought you know, I knew, I knew to let that thought go and to keep there, stay, because I knew that it was like, we just, what do we say, a, a moment of grace where you experience these things. And I think all of us have had some kind of experience like this that becomes a sort of, wow, that's a touchstone, like a reference in our life. Wow, I could just do that, just drop it. And it happened and all the way through the garden, so there's maybe 50 steps. I didn't count. But as we walked our way and wound our way through the garden, I was trying to make the path as long as possible because it's a very small garden. Right? <laughs> so I said, let's go this way. <laughs> but eventually we came out. And there was this feeling of now the kind of spell has been broken because we said we would just do it in that garden. And we had this amazing, I had an amazing experience. My brother said he also did. So it was a sort of uh, a joint effort. <laughs> and when we came out, uh, of course the feeling is still there. And the feeling is, oh, I, could, I could keep this, yeah. But then it's time for lunch. <laughs> and then it's time for something else, you know, and there's a conversation. And of course, that is why uh, we, we, we invite ourselves to have lunch silently so we can keep a continuum. So it's possible because we practice mindfulness throughout the day and not just for just little concentrated things, that we can keep a continuum. And keep, the, uh, keep it alive that we are present to this present moment. And of course, in that day, I don't remember so much of the day apart from that walk in the garden. The walk in the garden, I kind of remember every step. It was one of those experiences. It's like magical. So when we um, come out of the garden, metaphorically, we 
we want to somehow remember to go back to the garden and to try and keep um, the conditions available to us to touch that again. Because it's actually a very important experience to make. And it's important to keep the conditions that are favorable to that experience. But at the same time, not grasping after, you know, if I, grasping for that. If it beca- and if it becomes, you know, something that you, just a memory, and you think it will never happen again, or if you think it was just a moment of grace that you had no control over, it just happened. That's a shame. I think more it was, um, we can't always know what the causes and conditions are, but we're told a lot of it has to do with this just dropping the whole thing that we're holding on to. The notions that we have about ourselves, about the world, about the way things are going, even our notions about spirituality. Just let it go. You know, there's, there's, there's these um, stories in the Buddhist time. If there's this expression, very, I, I remember I told my Christian cousin this expression, and she was very shocked. If you meet the Buddha on the path, kill, kill him. It was a bit shocking, right? <laughs> but the idea there is you kill your notion of the Buddha in order to make a re- an encounter, to make it possible for you to have a real encounter with a Buddha, sometimes we have to kill our notion of the Buddha. So that's the meaning of that. So letting go of notions and also afflictions, it can be immediate. It doesn't have to be, yes, there is the practice, yes, there is deep looking, yes, there is beginning anew with the person. Uh, but there is also this potential we have to just, just drop it. And even if we can do that for a short time, we can make a, a, a very powerful experience like that. There is a story um, of Thai, uh, which I feel is very powerful. When he was, uh, Thai had written a, a calligraphy, and I just, I, by the way, I, I, I wanted to make sure I got my facts right, so I checked the story. It's in this book, At Home in the World, and it's this, but. Um, I had made a calligraphy, if you want peace, peace is with you immediately. If you need peace, peace is with you immediately. So if you really want it, like I really wanted that experience in the, to, the, the kingdom is now or never, I really needed that and somehow I could let go and be available for it. But in Thai applied this uh, calligraphy, if you need peace, peace is with you immediately, in a very difficult situation. In a situation where in 1976 he was trying to help 800 uh, Vietnamese boat refugees uh, to get to a, a place of sanctuary, maybe Australia. And they were actually in the port of Singapore at the time. And this, unfortunately, um, you know, it was the politics of the time. Where they, it was, they didn't want this to be happening. So they found uh, Thai was doing this work and about to have uh, these refugees that were on this boat going, and it was going to be a publicized thing once they got to Australia. So they told Tai he had to leave in 24 hours. And effectively, that meant for Tai he had to leave these people, these 800 people, 
and in that moment with his uh, colleagues uh, they didn't sleep in the night and Tai said to himself it's important I touch peace right now to be able to handle um, this situation because he felt even he was on solid land he felt he was with the, the boat people adrift in this boat and their lives were in peril so he practiced the, the phrase if I, if I need peace peace is with me immediately and with his mindful steps like walking into the garden whew, he was surprised he says in the book to find he could touch peace and he wanted to maintain that. He said, if I cannot maintain this peace to deal with this situation, then all the peace that I have touched in my practice, it's not the kind of peace that for me is, you know, meaningful. If it's not relevant to this situation. So he maintained his peace and therefore maintained his lucidity and was able to find a way. You have to read the story. <laughs> okay. okay. So I've kind of touched on um, impermanence, nirvana, believe it or not, we went there. It's a scary subject, nirvana, oh my gosh. Yeah. Remembering that nirvana is a direction, not a destination. So as soon as we turn ourselves, we can, yeah. we touched on letting go, letting go of notions. Letting go of afflictions and contemplating non craving is the last one, but it was, yeah, it was supposed to be impermanence and non craving. Yeah. But non craving is a beautiful thing to contemplate. Imagine you're sitting in meditation and you're not wanting anything, you're not grasping after anything and in our life we're often grasping after something there is some condition that we need to be totally happy it could be a material thing we, or we want to get into this college or we want to uh, get this partner that's somebody we were in love with I don't know it could be um, mm. Yeah, we want, we want to get a, a house or something we feel, a condition we need for our happiness. And often that condition we put in front of ourselves for happiness, you know, there's so many stories that you'll hear in the Dharma discussion of, I got the thing I thought I needed and then I'm still not happy. Have you ever met somebody very rich and they will never say that that money is what's bringing, if they have happiness, and they may even you know, be suffering a lot, and the, mo the money is not helping. It's possible to be happy with money. <laughs> it's possible, but it's not the condition to have a lot of money. And I, we, you hear these stories uh, firsthand, and they're very useful because we, all of us have this dream 
that with a lot of money I would be able to do these wonderful things, you know. And we're not just, just to question these, these things, huh? So sometimes our idea of happiness is blocking our actual happiness. So to let go of our ideas, even of our happiness, is a practice that is an experiment you can make. Try it and see. You know, you're not going to die if you let go of that idea of happiness for five minutes. <laughs> and that's all it takes to realize Oh, that idea of happiness, I let go of it and I touch something more beautiful. Similarly, in our, we're doing sitting meditation and we're thinking, I'm going to touch happiness in my meditation when I get this concentrated or when uh, this person next to me stops uh, making a funny noise. And we, there's these conditions which seem to be in our way, obstacles. And even when we get the perfect conditions, we find our mind is still in that mode of grasping, of saying, yeah, but, 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 but. And to just drop that and say, no, this all the conditions I need are here. Things are perfect just as they are. Perfect in their imperfection. They're imperfect conditions and that's perfect. You can say that to yourself. Say, I don't need the perfect conditions. If you wait for the perfect conditions, it'll be more than 300 years. <laughs> so, coming back and saying, whatever the situation is now, trusting that this is, that's fine. And not putting anything in front of yourself. And just being able to say, yeah, this is it. This is the present moment, and this is my life. Here I am. I'm okay with that. And being present from that place, the, because you stop the grasping, you stop the craving for some other condition, you can you start to get into a place where, oh, this is quite nice. There's nothing to do, I don't need to grasp, I'm, I'm fine just as I am. My mind is doing what it's doing. Oh, there's my breathing. Nothing. It's just okay. And you're enjoying your sitting. You're enjoying your breathing. Nothing to add. It's just like that. Wonderful experience to make. That we can be happy, dwell happily in the present moment. The Buddha it's quoted as saying, Drista Dharma Sukha Vihara. It's the Sanskrit for dwelling happily in the present moment. Drista Dharma Sukha Vihara. Finding our abode uh, right, and our happiness right here and now. So that is to touch on the contemplation, the meditation, if you like, the samadhi of non-craving. It's sometimes called aimlessness, not, ha not having an aim. It doesn't mean that you don't do anything in life. <laughs> Just because you practiced aimlessness doesn't mean you suddenly uh, don't have things that you want to um, 
projects to complete, but your attitude with which you are engaging can be completely different. The attitude to which, you know, it's not about what you do, but how you do it. That's the real substance of, of life. You know, so even the thing that you do succeeds if you did it with a lot of tension and a lot of anxiety and maybe along the way you hurt people. What, was it really a success? And even if you seemingly seem to fail in your endeavor, you know, Thai did all of this work for bringing peace in the situation of war in Vietnam. Many people will say what Thai did didn't bring an end to the war. The war came to an end for other reasons. But it's not exactly the result of the historic dimension that's important. It was the way in which he, he went there. And it's brought seeds of peace all around the world to, to come into people's hearts. And people understand that it's the, you know, the, the ends don't justify the means. The means are the ends. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. So we have to make it... Um, if we want peace, we have to practice for that peace in a peaceful way. If we want people to stop discriminating, we also have to bring them, the discriminator, the one we see causing the injustice, into our heart. and recognize they too are me. I can understand that. I can be in their shoes. I can see from their point of view why they're doing that. So you no longer are angry with them, discriminate. The Buddha said that uh, non-craving, when we have an object of desire, We're very fixed on um, that this object of our desire will bring us some happiness. The Buddha said something very interesting, which is when you see the nature of the object of your desire, you will no longer desire it. When you see its true nature, and it could be a contemplation for you, is that true? If I really contemplate the object of my desire, the thing that has kind of got hold of me, and if I contemplate it long enough with just mere recognition, just what is this object of desire that I so long for and I think will give me this thing? Maybe it's uh, some food, some profiterole. Oh, if I could just sink my teeth into that, everything would... Or a coffee. Oh, I've heard that they do coffee in Upper Hamlet. We must get there. <laughs> so something small like that you can choose to be the object that you meditate on. You say, And if you sit with it long enough, sure enough, eventually you'll come to the point, yeah, I guess it's not actually the coffee, you know. The coffee is coffee. It's okay. But the grasping mind, the mind that is grasping after is craving. When we get into the place of really seeing the object of our desire, we also get in touch with the mind which is desiring. And we see the suffering also of that. And the, the, in a way, the, the smallness of that grasping, that it's not we're going for a very small thing, in a way. We see that. And when we let go of the grasping, and we see, oh, well, it's just, that's just the object of desire, and it's, it's fine as it is. I don't need to consume it. I don't need to... 
And we see that it's also into being with everything and that we're into being. And then, you know, uh, you can touch this place of, uh, I'm, I'm bigger than that. <laughs> I'm bigger than that little thing that I think will give me happiness, or even a big thing. And I can let, maybe it's a person, and you think, if I have them in my life, I would be happy. But you contemplate that person and you realize they have qualities that I feel I lack or something. Well, I need companionship, and that's okay. But you start to see the non... Uh, you've objectified it all into this person, and then you see that actually there are things that you need, and you think you're going to get, but maybe you see that when you break it down, that you can meet those needs in other ways. When you lose someone, You have grief, you feel this sense of loss. And then you, when you contemplate deeply, you start to see, ah, oh, but they are already in me. And the qualities that they had that I, I so miss, I can cultivate in myself. And they, they transmitted them to me. And they are also in the children or they are in other people. Thai is still with us. He's in Thailand, and he's also in his books, and he's also in Plum Village, he's in the Sangha. When you go home today, this uh, realizing I need to wrap up, <laughs> when you go home tomorrow, when you go home to, tomorrow, if you, if you don't have another week with us, um, remember that you have the Sangha in you. You're much more than, you know, you feel that, oh, you're on your own again. Just me and this little body and this little mind. And yes, your practice sometimes goes down, your individual practice. So at times that you, you need support, remember the Sangha, remember Plum Village. We're, the Sangha is in you, behind you. And you can... Um, also find uh, people to practice with in your local area. So don't uh, go back to that small place, oh, I'm, I'm, it's just me again. Yeah? Stay connected with your Sangha body, it means other, your friends, your, the strengths of your ancestors. And yeah, take care of yourself and know that your practice is, is important for uh, the world. So that's the encouragement. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Please enjoy your walking meditation in the, the kingdom is, is soon. Yes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.